But when you look at that same million dollars and you invest it anywhere else, doing anything else, building hospitals, hiring teachers, Welcome, Bruce Gagnon, to Pangea. It's very nice of you to be here with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. In your opinion, for what reason Russia decide to carry out the military intervention in Ukraine? In what broader context does the war in Ukraine fit? Well, I think we have to go back to at least 2014 when the United States orchestrated a coup d'etat in Kiev, installing a new government that was really backed by the muscle of uh, Nazis from who predominate in Western Ukraine. And immediately the people in Eastern Ukraine along the Russian border in what's called the Donbass region, they became very fearful because one of the first things this new government did was to say that the speaking of Russian in Ukraine would be illegal. So people began holding peaceful protest marches in Eastern Ukraine, and they also were gathering signatures for a referendum saying, let's have a federated Ukraine where we have local autonomy, we can speak what language we wish to speak, and we can also elect our own local officials rather than have them uh, appointed by the new government. And so immediately, under the direction of the US and NATO, uh, Nazis were sent eastward into the Donbass. One of the first uh, videos I saw, in fact, was in Mariupol uh, in 2014. I was watching all of this uh, on YouTube, basically. Uh, in real time, right before my eyes. And uh, the people of uh, uh, Mariupol were protesting and Nazis were sent in and I saw them gunning people down, shooting them in the streets. So very quickly, the people tried to defend their families. It was literally at that point. Most of the people that came into this, what I called self-defense forces to protect themselves against these Nazis, came out of the coal mines and they were school teachers and electricians and musicians, a real people's militia. And uh, so this is really how the civil war began. Russia did not invade, as is often said in mainstream media, but they did over time begin to supply weapons to these self-defense forces so they could protect themselves and their families. At the same time, the United States and NATO set up a military training base. This was during the Obama administration. They set up a military training base in the western side of the country, again, the region where the Nazis predominate. And it was there that they were training these Nazis, brought them into a new special forces unit that was created by the United States. And I even uh, watched video uh, in 2016 of Obama's ambassador to Ukraine going to this base, meeting with soldiers that were coming from the United States to train these Nazis. So this is really uh, the mess that was created intentionally, I believe, because the United States fears the growing 
power of Russia and China. This unity uh, of those two economies, uh, signing up other countries to be part of a multipolar world where this idea of the U.S. being the uni unipolar power, the single power of the world, as it has been so much since uh, the end of World War II. The U.S. fears that dramatically and knows that it only has a small window left, a small amount of time to try to break this multipolar uh, movement apart. And so this is what I believe is behind this whole thing. Uh, the U.S. is trying to create a festering sore along the border of Russia. And in the Rand Corporation, one of the Pentagon uh, think tanks that's based in California, they did a study in 2019 that says the, uh, we've got to over, overextend and unbalance uh, Russia. And we must use Ukraine as a tool in order to do that. So they knew that if they could create an Afghanistan or a Syria type situation along the Russian border, it would force Russia to militarily intervene. It would force Russia to spend a lot of money on the military. It would not be going for human needs. And it would also allow the West to further demonize Moscow, calling for regime change in Russia and ultimately to break Russia up into smaller countries like the US and NATO did in 1999 with the balkanization of Yugoslavia. Uh, the reason I believe that they want to break uh, Russia into smaller countries is because of uh, climate change in part with the melting, <clears throat> excuse me, with the melting of the Arctic ice. Uh, there's uh, the ability to drill baby drill in that Arctic region. And in fact, just as this war started uh, in February, the US and NATO were holding war games up in Northern Norway along the Russian Arctic coast. It's called cold response. Uh, and increasingly we see the developments of US uh, war games, military exercises up in the Arctic region. So clearly the West wants the resources that Russia has, vast resource base. They want to break Russia into smaller pieces. And I think that's what's really driving all of this. So Russia knew they had to intervene at some point. 14,000 people have died in the Donbass since 2014, since the constant shelling of the Russian ethnic citizens along the Russian border. And so Russia knew they had to intervene to save lives uh, because the Ukraine <clears throat> government had uh, positioned 150,000 troops right along the contact line with the Donbass and were poised to invade in a full scale assault. Thank you. Now, the Pentagon published on April 14 a fact sheet on U.S. assistance to Ukraine security with an impressive list of armaments provided to Kyiv's forces. The official rationale is that in this way the U.S. is helping Ukraine defend itself against Russia aggression. Is this the case or is the reason different? Well, I think <clears throat> there's several things that work here. Number one is this war is going to benefit the weapons industry, the military industrial complex in a dramatic way. Not only is the United States supplying Ukraine with, with uh, military hardware that must be eventually replaced, obviously, but then also the NATO countries, <clears throat> particular, particularly Eastern uh, European NATO members are supplying uh, Ukraine with this military hardware. It's outdated technology, a lot of it's Soviet era military technology. And as a result, uh, being NATO members, they're going to have to purchase new stocks of weapons 
And as it turns out, anytime a NATO country, uh, a new NATO country comes into NATO, they, they are forced to buy weapons that are interoperable, meaning that they fit inside of the U.S. space-directed warfare system. They have to be interoperable with U.S. technology. So that means that they largely have to buy their weapons from American corporations. Well, this, so this is the other thing that's happening by forcing Eastern European NATO members to deplete their weapon stocks. They're going to have to replace them with interoperable technology. The U.S., of course, will be in charge of the tip of the spear as they create this expanded NATO military mechanism. And NATO is now going international as they're signing up NATO partners throughout the Asia Pacific region, including Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, and other countries as well. So really NATO is saying that uh, we're not just protecting Europe anymore, we're now going global. And I think one of the reasons for this is because at the United Nations, when NATO goes <clears throat> to the UN Security Council, and ask for a resolution in support of another war, Russia and China are able to block that. But when NATO can create an international alliance, it believes it'll be able to go to the world and say, look, we have an international, we have global support for these military actions, as they're trying to do now with the, the this operation in Ukraine. So, uh, all of this then benefits the military industrial complex. But then beyond that, going back to my earlier comment, you create this festering sore, this, this endless war situation. And we've heard from, uh, I think his name is Mr. Burrell with the EU saying that the only way to solve this problem in Ukraine is through a war. Negotiations will not work. So it's quite clear that the U.S. and NATO, and I'm sure they're instructing Zelensky, uh, but we shouldn't call him Zelensky because we're not allowed to use the word the, the letter Z anymore. So we have to call him Elensky. But anyway, I believe Elensky is taking his marching orders from the CIA. They're handing him a script written by Madison Avenue public relations firms in New York City and Hollywood. And him being an actor, I'm sure he's quite adept at being able to read that script. So no negotiations. Zelensky or Elinsky is saying we're going to fight for the next 10 years. And so they're trying to put in the public's mind that this war is going to be a long one, another Afghanistan all over again. There are reports about the presence of U.S. military personnel in Ukraine. Have you any information about this? What is the role of such personnel? Well, I said earlier that <clears throat> soon after the coup d'etat in 2014, orchestrated by the United States, the U.S. and NATO set up a training base, military training base in Western Ukraine and to this base were brought U.S. Special Forces units from Fort Carson, Colorado. And their job was to train these Nazis and then take off their uh, uniforms that had uh, Nazi insignias and everything else and put on uh, uniforms issued by the United States to make it look like they were real army. So. Uh, I knew about this because one of my dear friends, his son is in U.S. Army Special Forces and was stationed at Fort Carson, Colorado. And on two occasions, my friend's son was sent to this training base in Ukraine. So I knew about it directly. And then I, I noted earlier that I watched a video where Obama's ambassador in 2016 a guy named Jeffrey Piot. He was part of that famous phone call with Victoria Newland 
in 2014, just after the coup happened in Maidan, where they were on the phone talking about uh, F the EU, we're going to pick who we want to pick as the new leader of, uh, of, of Ukraine. So anyway, since that time, we know that Ukraine has been flooded with American and other NATO troops. And at this very moment that we're speaking together <clears throat> in the city of Mariupol in, in uh, Eastern Ukraine, uh, the Nazis have mostly been routed. Several thousand have now surrendered to the Russians. <clears throat> But inside that huge steel works factory, they say underneath it, there's a Soviet era uh, underground system of six to eight floors deep. And inside of this place, they say there are several thousand Nazis and most importantly, I think, U.S. and NATO military advisors. So it's clear to me, having repeatedly heard about these U.S. NATO military advisors throughout Ukraine at this current time, uh, it's clear that the U.S. and NATO are still directing this operation. They're leading it. And it's obvious to me that the Ukrainian military <clears throat> made up of, number one, Nazis, but also conscripts people that were forced into the military, young people come off the farms, uh, come out of the cities looking for jobs or actually uh, forced into being, being there. They were probably not highly motivated to fight the Russians, knowing that they were up against one of the world's most powerful militaries. And so we hear repeatedly that the Nazis are saying anybody that surrenders will be shot and uh, I'm certain that the U.S. and NATO advisors are forcing this kind of dynamic into this battle that's going on today. But just in the last two or three weeks, there have been several attempts by the Ukrainian government to send in helicopters into this area of this steelworks in Mariupol to try to take someone out and on every occasion, uh, the Russians shot down the helicopters. But on one of the occasions, uh, uh, they shot down a helicopter, but two people lived. They were not killed when the helicopters crashed. And it is rumored, I, I don't know this for a fact, but it's been uh, rumored repeatedly <clears throat> that one of the people caught, apprehended, was a U.S. major general. Uh, so it, it's obvious to me that the U.S. and NATO were so desperate to risk the lives of these helicopter pilots, risk lives of uh, anybody that they could put on the helicopters to have them escape. There were some important people in there. And Russia is also, incidentally, saying that they're picking up communications, phone communications, from the bottom of that steelworks. Uh, in six different languages. And the Russians have said they've identified English, French, Swedish, German, and probably Italian as well. So I think there's no doubt about it that the U.S. and NATO are in this war. It's not just a Ukraine versus Russia war. This is a U.S.-NATO war using Ukraine as a tool in order to fight against Russia. Thank you, Bruce Gagnon. Now, a last quick a question for a quick reply. According to your knowledge of US politics, when and how do you foresee the end of the war in Ukraine? Well, just uh, in the last two days, a message came out from CBS television news where they interviewed a senator, a U.S. senator by the name of Chris Coons from the state of Delaware. He's from the same state that Joe Biden is from. 
He's this Chris Coons is said to be uh, the leading senator who is most close to Joe Biden. He declared on CBS uh, News that the United States should now send troops to Ukraine to help the Ukrainian government. Obviously, they see that that uh, Ukraine is losing this thing badly. And so I think there is going to be a move to send U.S. troops and NATO troops, I, uh, particularly maybe a country like Poland, for example, uh, right on the border, send their troops in as well. So we're in a very dangerous moment. Uh, and again, I, I think that the, the, this desire to send U.S. NATO troops in there immediately underscores this desire to keep this war going. So I don't see an immediate end to it. Even if Russia was to completely, quote unquote, finish things up in the next weeks, couple of weeks, I think the U.S. and NATO will continue every effort they can to destabilize, to continue to arm. Uh, right now in the United States, the U.S. is training Ukrainian artillery people going to give them new artillery equipment and send them back to Ukraine. And they'll be able to fire into the Donbass region from far away. So that means that Russia will continually have to try to take those artillery positions out. So this thing is going to drag on for some time. My, that's not good news, actually. Well, thank you so much, Bruce Gagnon, for your participation. It was extremely interesting. Well, uh, it doesn't leave us uh, much hope in the future, but let's hope for the best. Well, I think Thank we you. all, in all, in all of our countries, we all have to work harder and harder to mobilize to try to stop this because it could lead to World War III, which could go nuclear in a red hot flash. My. Okay, thank you so much. You've been very kind to participate into our program. And um, I hope to meet you soon. Thank you. In person. Thank you. Bye.